I'd like to invite Professor Houston Kwa, President of the Economic Society of Singapore, to give us the opening remarks. Prof Kwa, please. Our guest of honour, Deputy Prime Minister, Minister for Finance, Mr Lawrence Wong. Excellencies, distinguished guests, friends and colleagues, ladies and gentlemen. A very good morning to everyone attending the Singapore Economic Policy Forum 2022. This year, we are honoured to have Mr Lawrence Wong, Deputy Prime Minister and Minister for Finance, as our guest of honour and keynote speaker. On behalf of my fellow council members and society, I thank DPM Wong for his encouraging presence and we look forward to hearing from him later. As most of you would have known, the Economic Society of Singapore is a non-profit organization of economists, professionals, academicians, and policymakers with great interest in economics. We have been established since 1956. Our primary objective is to raise public awareness, stimulate public interest, and debate in economic issues. Hence, this policy forum has been organized annually and this is our 15th conference, to provide a leading platform for economic policy discussion, focusing more on Singapore and the region. Every year, the Society organizes this forum together with NUS, NTU, and SMU, and now newly joined SUSS in rotation. So we welcome the participation of SUSS in this inaugural forum. So this year, we are glad to organize this forum with the title Forward Future Singapore, Economics and Interdisciplinary Studies for the Social Good. Now, cultivating social good is a key objective to Singapore amidst the multitude of competing objectives and budgetary constraints. How do we approach this multifaceted task of prioritizing what matters most? Whose priorities should they entail? Embedded to these questions must be serious efforts to elicit society's preferences. This is important in matters which impact livelihoods, health, and the quality of life in the future. It helps to prioritize what people really want. Government provides all kinds of public goods and services, transport infrastructure, environmental goods, health, education, social safety nets, and security, all of which demands resources. But because of financial constraints, it often requires a judgment call and an understanding of priorities. But whose priorities should they entail? Should they be the purview of only the experts? Or should they be only a government's views? Or encompass as much information as possible from all segments of society to arrive at an inclusive and informed decision? Sometimes there is a gap between what experts think and what the public wants and value. Hence, eliciting public preferences requires serious effort as they impact all our lives. This will help policymakers to identify priorities of what people really want, and how successful the policy implementation will depend very much on how that policy is perceived by the people, whether they embrace it or not. Take, for example, the recent letter of protest in social media on the removal of a 70-year-old tree in a neighborhood in Amokyo. I read that with great interest. In place of the tree, there is now a new cycling path, which the author claims is of little demand in this neighborhood. Clearly, in this case, there are competing demands in the use of this land area. Without eliciting people's preferences, there will be cases of conflicts where one, might, one, where one use might be preferred over another, and, be deri and by deriving this priority of preferences, a more informed decision can be made. Now, this is not to suggest that people's preferences must take precedence over all other considerations, including expert opinion. But surely the information obtained from eliciting preferences will provide a greater understanding of the intensity of choices and thus guide decisions better. Society's preferences are dynamic too, and therefore we must have long-term adaptability of what constitutes society's changing preferences to make decisions in the present. 
all stakeholders, government, academia and wider populace, need to be engaged to elicit these preferences. Intangible values of leisure, recreation, lowered stress, promoting ethics, social cohesion and improving good air quality, all of which could be evaluated by cost-benefit analysis, which will aid informed decision-making. Eliciting preferences and their methods found in cost-benefit analysis will also provide an important transparency to the policy-making process. Now, I'm glad that uh, you know, some years ago, I promoted this idea of setting a public project evaluation management center. And this was picked up actually at the Ministry of Finance, 2011, if I recall. And I think that serves a very important purpose in translating uh, conflicting issues you know, into a um, proper way of evaluating these issues in a systematic manner. So for some years now, I've been promoting this eliciting preferences through my writings and through my speeches. And I hope that with T.P. Wong here, you know, maybe this may catch on because I feel it's so important in conjunction with what T.P. Wong's objective uh, agenda on the future forward Singapore. So there are many changes challenges facing to Singapore, such as population is aging, income disparities are widening, economic growth is slowing, so we need to have an effective link between public preferences and economic policies. On June 28 this year, DPM Wong launched Forward Singapore at an NTUC tripartite dialogue, stressing the importance of building a more socially resilient society. This will require the continued investments into human capital adjustments of policies to cater to the changing needs of society. And more recently, D.P. Wong reiterated the need for public input and participation in shaping of social policies and programs. As a fellow economist, I'm very glad to voice my support, strong support to Forward Singapore. Economics must continue to be relevant to public life, and that is the founding goal of the Economic Society of Singapore. This goal cannot be emphasized more amidst the current turbulent times. We have global supply chain disruptions. We must balance carefully on economic inclusions as well as economic advances and economic growth. We also have inflation and price stability to worry for our small and a very open economy. All this seems worrying and grim, but with challenges come prospects for future growth as well. Out of the multiple challenges as mentioned, one of them has taken center stage in recent years, and that is to balance economic dynamism and inclusion and advancing social good, especially in the context of rising inflation. How does our economic society, especially this policy forum, assist in today's challenges? First, by bringing together members of various sections of society. With differing concerns, the economic society endeavours to facilitate exchange of views and ideas. This contributes to the stock information that policymakers draw from and allow the different voices to be heard. For today's forum, we have brought together speakers and members of the audience with different expertise and background experience. This would no doubt improve upon the stock of information that is crucial in policy design and forming. Secondly, through the interaction with one another in today's events and the numerous other events of the society, we hope that ideas will not only be exchanged for discussions but also created. Here is where a society and a forum with all of you here continue to play an important part in providing this feedback and at times in-depth comments with analysis to propose policies or evaluating the success of enacted policies. Hence, I encourage all of you to participate very actively in today's forum and the various events of the society as well. We have accomplished much, but we must not imagine the task now is easier than the one faced by the policymakers of the days before. All benefits must come with trade-offs and opportunity costs. These are the first principles in economics. Social needs and public attitudes naturally change over time, and the concerns of yesterday will not be the same as of today. Our speakers address these challenges with the purported view of dynamism, inclusion, and greater social good. Thank you, everyone. It is now my privilege to introduce and say a few words on our guest of honour and keynote speaker, DPM Lawrence Wong. Mr Wong is Singapore's Deputy Prime Minister and Minister for Finance. He is also a Member of Parliament for Marsling UT GRC. He co-chairs the Multi-Ministry Task Force on COVID-19, 
a regular fixture on our TV sets, radios and papers you know, in our fight against this pandemic, providing information and attention and assessment of the latest information on the pandemic. He is also Deputy Chairman of the Monetary Authority of Singapore and a member of the Government Investment Corporation or GIC Board, the Future Economy Council, the Research Innovation and Enterprise Council and the National Research Foundation Board as well as co-chairs the Singapore Shanghai Comprehensive Cooperation Council. In addition, DPM Wong contributes to the labor movements as chairman of the Singapore Labor Foundation, as well as advisor to the Union of Power and Gas Employees and the Building, Construction and Timber Cons Industries Employees Union. Mr. Wong was first elected as a member of parliament in May 2011 and has held positions in the Ministry of Defense, the Ministry of Communications and Information, the Ministry of Culture, Community and Youth, the Ministry of National Development and the Ministry of Education. Prior to entering politics, Mr. Wong was a civil servant. He was previously the Chief Executive of the Energy Market Authority when I first met him, serving as a member of the board at the time. In his various roles, Mr. Wong was also the Principal Private Secretary to the Prime Minister, Li Xianlong. DPM Wong was educated at Tanjung Katong Secondary School and Victoria Junior College. He obtained his bachelor's and master's degree in economics from the University of Wisconsin-Madison and the University of Michigan at Ann Arbor, respectively. He holds a master's degree in public administration from the Harvard Kennedy School. Distinguished guests, ladies and gentlemen, as you can see, DPM Wong has had a very accomplished career in society and without doubt a very experienced person. His entry into politics has been and continues to be one of significant value-added contribution to Singapore. It is now my honour to invite DPM Wong to the stage to deliver his address to us. DPM Wong, please.